Good afternoon. On behalf of Mayor Carl Dean and Library Director Donna Nicely, I'd like to welcome you to the, the public library once more. Uh, my name is Ryan Perry. I'm the reference manager here at the main library. Um, there's a couple of things I'd like to go over with you before the program starts. And in your, each of your seats, there's a little invitation here for uh, a reception for the local artist Alan LaCroix. And from now through May, we're going to be having several programs. So if you like art, I'd like to invite you to come to some of these. Uh, on February 28th, this, this will all take place here in the conference center or the art gallery directly across. As you came in, you may have seen some of Mr. LaCroix's sculptor in, in the art gallery, or if you've been to the Parthenon uh, and seen his Athena, our front doors were done by Mr. LaCroix, so he's, he's quite an artist. Um, on February 28th, from 11 to 1, there will be a, a, a multi-generational celebration um, called Cultural Heroes. And this will include stories, live music performances, and we'll have some crafts where you'll create a, a, either a portrait or a comic strip or a flip, flip book. And this is multi-generational, so if you have children, or some, some of you out there may have grandchildren, uh, you can bring those, and it, it, it'll really be a lot of fun for the whole family. Then in March, uh, Mr. LaCroix here in the Conference Center will give a slideshow and talk about his development as a, uh, a nationally known artist. In April 18th, he will be using a live model and you can come and see how this is actually done. If you've never seen anybody actually doing sculpture, you can, you can see him in, in action. Um, April 18th, here in the conference room, Vanderbilt professor Robert Fry will give a, a, a talk on the cultural heroes and focus on their musical and social contributions. Um, and then finally in May, beginning at 10.30 at the front doors, Mr. LaCroix will talk about his um, sculpture there and will end up visiting his studio from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. So if you've never seen an artist studio, this is a good opportunity. All of these programs are free. Um, if you'd like a um, full schedule, they're in the art gallery right across the, the hallway there and has all the dates and times available for you and I hope you can join us. So now let's get on with the program and I would like to introduce Christine Bradley. She is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Community, Neighborhood and Government Relations at Vanderbilt. Give me a hand. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, on this cold, cold day, I'm glad as many of you could come out as you could. And it, just as a, a testimony to your tenacity that you were able to find a place to park and get here. Uh, I don't know what's going on at the convention center, but it must be something spectacular. Um, you know, I was, wanted to once again thank David Wood for bringing us a fabulous speaker today um, on the whole issue of art. And I think that there are probably as many worlds and as many realities out there as there are pieces of art. Um, and one of, um, all those surveys aren't usually a reality or a piece of art, um, it is a reflective of Vanderbilt reality. Um, so at your seat, you will have, a, there's a survey about the lunches, the lunch, and lunch boxes, and we would really like your input on how we, how we might move forward um, and continue this. But without further ado, I wanna just go ahead and welcome David Wood, thank you. Well, thanks, thanks, Ron, and uh, thanks, Christine, and thank you all for, as she says, coming out on this frosty day. If, if, we, uh, if we wake up uh, one morning to find that the columns on prestigious Vanderbilt campus buildings have been repainted sky blue, the, you know, the authorities need not look far. The culprit will be Mel Ziegler. Um, Mel, <laughs> Mel has been professor and uh, professor of Art and Chair of the Art Department at Vanderbilt since the fall of uh, 2007 after spending 10 years as a professor of sculpture at the University of Texas in Austin. He was first educated at the Kansas City Art Institute and subsequently earned an MFA from the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia. In Kansas City he met Kate Erickson with whom for 18 years he made influential, site-specific installations and objects. 
mapping trajectories, questioning history, and highlighting the specificity of places and communities. Their partnership was the subject of an exhibition at MIT in 2006 called America Starts Here. And Mel continues with solo shows and to engage nationally and internationally in what some people have called interventionist art. Well, what kind of work does he do? You can look on his website. Uh, that's www.melziegler.com. You're going to have to update it um, for a whole bunch of projects just waiting for funding. But to give you an example, he recently completed a, a project, Downtown Mixer, in Houston, Texas, collecting uh, air samples, or I guess breath samples, from about 1,600 participants in, different, in eight different high-rise um, buildings. And I think in one version of this project, the air gets re-released in the boardroom of a, a multinational corporation. I, I don't know how that, whether that one's uh, happening. Um, Ziegler's current projects include a public art master plan for Lake Como Park in Fort Worth, Texas, and a major public art commission for the Art in Public Places program in Cambridge, um, Massachusetts. He's recently received the Big Bang Award from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, where he's creating a campus-wide interactive public art project. Mel has a distinguished public profile, not just as an artist, but as an academic. He earned a Loeb Fellowship for study at Harvard in 1996, and he's lectured throughout the United States and Europe and South America. So what, what is this business of public art? Ziegler's committed to making public art happen. He's on record as wanting to make community art more visible on the Vanderbilt campus, and eventually the city of Nashville. Now, some undoubtedly see art as a luxury, especially in these difficult times. Not Ziegler. Interviewed on his arrival here in Nashville, he said, people don't go to cities because they have great sewer systems. <laughs> they go to cities because there's a great culture. That's what attracts people. That's what attracts corporations. All this makes being an artist more exciting than ever before. Mel Ziegler chaired the Austin, City of Austin Arts Commission for three years. He succeeded in convincing the city council to raise the amount of construction project funds that go to public art from 1% to 2%. Let's hope he can have the same impact here in Nashville. The title of Mel's talk today is Beyond Public? Please welcome professor and public artist Mel Ziegler. Um, thank you, David, um, and and thank you. It's it, this this is this is amazing to see this group here, and I think it seems like a a, a, a wonderful program that uh, you have going here, and it's and it's great to see the attendance. Um, I titled today's talk "Beyond Public." Um, it comes actually from uh, my idea that I wanted to create this organization called Beyond Public. And the problem was I could never really figure out exactly what that organization was going to do, so I kind of gave it up. So, um, but so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd reconfigure that into the, today's lecture. But I, but I think it's 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 mostly because um, I uh, the idea of public art has been sort of a career-long obsession. I mean, the questions that public art uh, you know raise has been a career-long obsession with me. I think I, you know I've been doing it doing it. Um, ever since I was in undergraduate school. And I guess, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed by it, really. I mean, I, I sort of raise these questions all the time, even to myself, and how does it operate, how does it function? And then I ask myself, well, is it, is it really public art that I do? And I think that's the key issue. I mean, because, maybe because uh, public art uh, brings along with it uh, a lot of baggage, uh, a lot of sort of connotations that have to do with civicness and, and the city and, and community input and, and processes that go on and on and on. And sometimes I find myself sort of outside of that. Um, so I, so it, it's, it's, it's these kind of questions that I think are interesting for a community to ask themselves about what it is that they embrace 
in relationship to public art, civic art. Um, and so what I wanted to do uh, to today, and I told David that I, I would probably end up just showing you a few of my works by the way of sort of raising some of these questions and maybe sort of raising uh, you know, questions in you all in terms of what, what actually could happen as a public art project. Uh, I, I have been very involved in, in, the, in the community of Austin when I was there. Uh, and I, it's a long story, but, but I was arts commissioner for six years, chair of the arts commission for two, and vice chair for, uh, a chair for three, and vice chair for two. So I was very active. I mean, I was very involved in, 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 and also on the art and public places panel for um, two years. And so, and that's when we actually were able to change this 1% to 2%. So it's, it's, it's a passion of mine. And I really believe that Austin is better for it. And I, and, and I think um, there are a lot of great projects happening right now. I think there's over 20 different art and public places projects happening in Austin, Texas right now. And I think uh, I, can, I can feel slightly responsible for some of that happening. Um, I, wanna, I just want to propose a couple questions before I start. Um, and that is, is, is the question, could and should art be anywhere? Um, and maybe, maybe the problematic word is, is, is the idea of something that, that it should be somewhere. And, and so it, it kind of raises the issue of whether or, not, uh, you know, whether or not it's a physical thing. I mean, is it possible for art to operate as an event or a process uh, rather than an actual physical manifestation? The other question I might ask is, as a public artist, uh, who is my audience? And again, the question might be, uh, is audience the right word? Because maybe audience suggests pass, uh, a passiveness. And I like to think of my art as something that's engaging, something that uh, is, is a kind of within a socially active space, a socially engaging space. And that's always been a very important part of my work. And, um, and then uh, the third would be, uh, how do we, as you know, how do we, um, become part, as artists, how do we become part of the world around us? Uh, how do we engage and how do we integrate? And these are, these are key issues in, in a lot of the work that I, I did with my late partner, Kate Erickson, which I'm gonna show two projects of, and then I'm gonna move into some of my newer work and talk about it, and then hopefully afterwards we can you know, talk, uh, David and, and you all can raise some questions and we can talk back and forth a little bit. Um, I guess there's a point where one can sort of claim themselves uh, a, a, you know, an, a, an expert on something. And since I've been doing this all my life for s over 30 some years, maybe I'm close to that point. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I think of uh, the idea of expertise and, and, and then once you become an expert, you become a talking head on CNN or the Rachel Maddow show, you know. So that's, that's kind of what my goal is. I'm looking forward to that day when I can claim that. So anyway. Um, so I'm going to go. I'm going to go right into this project here, and maybe if we can have the lights down. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that Kate and I were very active in in the, in the 1980s, there was a big discussion about public art that was going on, and um, there was there was this whole thing called the Seattle model, which was this idea of the design team and artists working. It's, it's it was sort of the beginnings of the of the one percent. Now. Calder, who sort of did one of the first sort of percent projects with the NEA, actually sort of designed a project without ever, without ever visiting the site in, in, in Michigan, um, and then just sort of putting it there. But, but there's been a big sort of progression and movement toward uh, artists sort of actually being very active and, and, and involved in the very early stages of design. And one of those things was this, was this Seattle model, where the, where the architect and artist got together on the same team, and they would decide you know, where the art would go, how the art would be integrated. And it was, it was the ability to get, to get the uh, artist in early enough that it could be in the construction document, so you could actually sort of integrate your work into the architecture. Well, Kate and I, even though we participated in some of those, in fact, Kate was on a design team for the Seattle Transit System, of which we have a project there that we did, uh, we were also sort of at odds to it, too, because we felt that there was a, a, too much kind of uh, perhaps compromise and complacency and sort of uh, a lot of the work ended up becoming very decorative. Um, and so it became sort of problematic for us. And so we became a kind of, um, we became a, um, 
uh, when when there, there were these public art conferences that would happen, and there were many over the over the in the 1980s, uh, we were invited to kind of be the odd person out and sort of give an alternative way of looking at things. And one of the things that uh, we we were invited to participate in was a public art conference that was taking place in in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, but part of that was that we had to we were commissioned to do a project. And so the way that Kate and I would work, and the way that I still work, is to go to a site, do a lot of research, looking around, uh, getting a uh, subscription to the newspaper to be sent back. We lived in New York at that time. We would have the newspaper sent to us in New York to try to keep up with what was going on, uh, but also do a lot of uh, research in terms of the history and so on. Well, in this case, um, we had a $10,000 budget. We were invited to do a project uh, as part of the conference, so it was going to take place over the period of the conference. And one of the things that on, on one of the visits to Durham we noticed was that there were these parts of the sidewalk all over downtown that were being repaired. And so you kind of saw these new sidewalk, these sections of new sidewalk, and there were a lot, sort of two or three sections long. And it became this kind of visual thing. It was sort of an interesting idea of, you know, kind of uh, making the city look better by not having the broken sidewalks. And during one of our, you know, one of the newspapers that came, we, we noticed that there was a revitalization plan that just had, been, had just been drafted. It was a, or it was a draft revitalization plan for downtown Durham that had just been passed by city council to be reviewed by the public. And the way that they were going to review it was to have two copies in the library uh, for people to read. And uh, Kate and I became very interested in that document, and we asked if we could... Uh, get, get, get a copy of it for ourselves and read over it. And once we did, we thought, well, this is, this is pretty important. This is amazing stuff. And the city should, you know, there should be another way in which this can be kind of, this information could be disseminated. So it kind of became, it, it, what it happens is it, it became part of the project. Uh, the combination of the sidewalks and this text, this 65-page text, became part of this project, which we called Loaded Text. Uh, and what you're seeing here is, um, there was a 150-foot section of sidewalk outside of the main uh, post office that needed replacement. And so Kate and I thought we would just make a project out of it, and actually in the process of doing our project, we would replace um, this sidewalk as a civic sort of uh, kind of improvement as part of our public commission. So um, here you have just sort of some images of us writing. It was a kind of a performance for about five days straight on our hands and knees, handwriting the 65-page text. And in terms, of, in terms of getting the information out about this, uh, it worked. It worked, but unfortunately, the way that it worked uh, was got people very angry at us. And we learned. <laughs> We learned, because they thought we were graffitiing the sidewalk and how dare they, you know, these New York artists and so on. But what happened was, uh, and we learned a really good lesson from this, and this is how, in terms of, as artists, how do you engage community? And one of the things that happened was that we talked for about an hour and a half to one of the writers at the local newspaper and thinking, okay, they're going to put the information out. But what we didn't realize is that the editors were going to sensationalize it and make it into a controversy. So they would, they would, they, th it was a great article but all the headlines were like con artists from New York, you know, and all that, you know. So, so at one point, uh, the, 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 um, the Cultural Arts Council was fielding over 200 calls from the community a day that they actually had to put extra people on. Now, what we learned from this is that we can't expect the newspapers to do the work that we should have done to begin with. We should have had community meetings, we should have talked about it, we should have explained it. From then on, this was back in the 1980s, from then on, actually when we did when we do, did do community projects, we would always have community meetings to talk about what it is that we were going to do. And the idea was, you didn't have to like what we're going to do, but don't get angry, just sort of have the dialogue with us, okay? So if you're angry, you don't have a dialogue, and so it ends there, and people were basically just angry at us. It was also at a time when there was a lot of a public art controversy. There was the whole uh, NEA controversy with Jesse Helms, and so everybody sort of was was a little touchy about art and what, 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 what art could do and what it shouldn't do. So what, what we did as part of our, as part of our uh, project is we hired a contractor to come in and break up the pieces into what we call one-person pieces so that they could lift and put onto, a, onto dump trucks. 
And then the dump trucks with this loaded text um, was placed, this rubble with the text on it, was placed in front of the Cultural Arts Council during the public art conference. <laughs> Detail. <laughs> and then afterwards what happened is the uh, pieces became riprap in a local bed stream that was eroding and the final project is a new sidewalk. There was no plaque, nothing, uh, nothing else, uh, sort of, you know, in terms of the project, there was no information about it. It just was this kind of civic thing. And we thought we were doing this great thing for the city of Durham. And little did we know how much controversy it would cause. But uh, that's it. That's the public art project. Now, what I like about this, and I think this is one of the most important projects that Kate and I did, it is because of the very nature of, as artists, integrating ourselves into conventional forms and processes that already exist in the urban environment. So we became sort of part of what was already going to happen eventually anyway. We know the sidewalk was going to be replaced, maybe not immediately, but maybe down the road a year or two later. And we, we as artists just kind of integrated ourselves into that whole process, into that system. And I like, I like this one because it just has this kind of really beautiful sort of circular kind of way of, of working and operating. Uh, as artists, you know, thinking about how we just kind of integrated into that system and, and created an art, artwork out of it. And it was, it was, it was you know, $10,000 is a pretty low budget. Um, and, and the thing is, is that one of the complaints was that that was a lot of money for this piece of sidewalk. But on the other hand, everything that we did except for our fee, which was about $2,000 out of the 10, um, went back to the city because, ex well, airline tickets, maybe not. But, but hotels and food and the contractors were all local, so they got pretty much all the money back. It is just one of the, this, we were front page news for a week at least. Um, second project that uh, Kate and I did, and probably one of our more well-known projects, was in um, Charleston, South Carolina. And it was part of an exhibition that was put together by a curator by the name of Mary Jane Jacobs, and it was part of the Spoleto Festival. Uh, the art component of the Spoleto Festival, which is the music festival, uh, in this case was a, a kind of a major component. It it, normally it wasn't quite as large as this one. It was a very ambitious project that Mary Jane put together. She was able to put a mass, an incredible amount of money for this exhibition. Um, I'd love to have something like this happen in, in, in uh, Nashville. But anyway, what, um, what she did is she invited 20, about 20 artists, international artists, and uh, she kind of had ideas of where these projects should take place. I mean, it's called Places with a Past. So she, she had um, buildings already sort of sit, uh, cited or things that she thought could happen uh, or places where art could happen. Uh, one was the old jail and a couple of other sort of historic sites. Um, Kate and I did a lot of house projects and it's not something I'm not going to show you. I mean, these are things that we did in suburban, uh, in the context of suburban areas and so on. And so that kind of continued with this. I mean, there's some of the, one of the things that we were thinking about. but. Again, the way that we would do our work is go in and research, think about what the, uh, the, the, you know, the history of the place and the economics of the place and so on. And one of the things that we found was that Charles, Charleston has one of the most, um, one of the earliest and one of the most severe preservation laws in the United States. Consequently, because of that, it didn't go through a lot of the urban renewal uh, of the 60s and 70s, and so a lot of these really beautiful Charleston-style homes still existed in downtown in the peninsula. And of course it's a peninsula, so there also is sort of limited amount of space in which people can have these wonderful homes. Um, so they kind of became discovered and uh, almost as like second homes. And uh, they were being bought up and there was this kind of this gentrification that was going on and people, you know, was just moving out the peninsula. Um, there was one group and this one community decided that they had to kind of stop this from happening. And so the preservation laws were so severe that some people couldn't afford to actually keep up with what was required of them to own a home because they couldn't, you know, if you had a certain type of roof that was historic, you couldn't go and put on a cheaper roof. You had to actually put on the original style roof. So um, they changed, this one community got together and decided to change the laws. And, and so there were two, there was a line sort of drawn down the peninsula. And on one side, it was called the historic. Uh, side of the city and the historic preservation on the other side, interesting enough, was the old city, you know, so it was sort of, I mean, even that as a, as a kind of 
a way of sort of informing you what's, what's happening. I mean, interesting that one's historic, one's old. Uh, the, 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 the designation of that, I think, is sort of interesting. Um, so the other thing that we discovered, uh, just thinking about the history and the military history, uh, the economics uh, being uh, both military and tourist industry. But we came across this paint chart called the Authentic Colors of Historic Charleston, um, which ended up having, uh, was, a, was an actual uh, uh, two different uh, color experts came into Charleston and kind of revealed what they thought were the 72 historic colors of Charleston, and then gave it over to the Ar Architectural Review Board to, um, to name the paint, and then Dutch Boy did a paint chart. And so some of the names are things like uniform, uh, Confederate uniform gray, rebellion blue black, uh, rags mall blue, and things like that. I mean, they're kind of related sort of superficially to history, geography, um, and so on. Um, so what we did is we found a house on this street. It was called Mary Street. This was the division between, uh, the division between, um, the historic and the old city. It was a Charleston style house, which is the type that has the, the, the porches on the side. And we wanted to kind of talk about this idea of, you know, this, this kind of sort of this pushing, this gentrification and this kind of like, you know, and, and sort of tie this all in with the history, the military, the economics and so on. So we came up with a project called Camouflage History. And we, <coughs> what we did is we, painted a house in a camouflage pattern that was actually designed by the U.S. military. We got them to collaborate with us. Uh, and it was, it was painted with all 72 colors from the historic Charleston chart. Now, normally this probably couldn't be done. But the, the, the way that this happened was that it was part of the Spoleto Festival. So it was already kind of packaged as something that's outside of the norm. And it was only going to happen for four months. So there's this temporary aspect to it. And it's something I didn't talk about even in terms of the first project because memory, I think, in my work plays a very important part in the public consciousness. I mean, so, so the question is whether something really has to be permanent or whether it's just permanent in, in the idea of, of memory, which I think is really important as well. So here you have the project. Uh, there's also uh, all the names of the paint were also silk screened onto the house. I'll just show you some details. And again, it only lasted for four months. Uh, I will say that the community that it was in, in the old city, wanted to actually keep it up for a whole year. But the community in the historic side said, no, it's an eyesore. It has to go. <laughs> so the, the homeowners didn't want a controversy. So they, so they ended up uh, painting it back. Part of the project was that they could paint it back to whatever colors they wanted. And interesting enough, they went back to the original colors, which was yellow with green trim. And I wish I had a painting of it, you know. Um, the way in which we did the camouflage pattern, and we got the U.S. military, is we did a 15-foot drawing that we, that we laid out flat, uh, a, a blueprint, and of, of just the details of the house, and we sent that off to uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, where there's a camouflage team. All five of the people that worked in this came down to the opening of the project, which was kind of fun. Okay, I'm not going to really talk about this project, but I wanted to show it just as a precursor to what I am going to talk about. Uh, this, is my, this is sort of newer work. I moved to Texas from New York, and suddenly I found myself sort of faced with being a Texan, and what does that mean? And, and I, w I will say I actually really liked it, you know. So um, there's that sense of identity that I think is so different from the rest of the United States, which is kind of interesting to me. And one of the things that I, I really enjoyed was the whole notion of the landscape. But also there's this kind of interesting thing about death and mythology in Texas. I mean, if you think about the things that they kind of celebrate, it all has to sort of revolves around notions of death. The Alamo, uh, San Jacinto. I mean, so, so uh, in this case, it was, it, I, what I did is this project that dealt with collecting air. This is an air compressor, and I collected air from uh, uh, eight different sites. Um, all having to do with the notion of death. And the only one that was kind of at the odds uh, to everything else was Huntsville, which is, which is where, um, where, where actually people were um, executed. And so that, that's a prison. So that was the only one that was outside of the other ones that had to do with his, the history of Texas. I worked together with a historian to determine what sites 
would be the most common and which were the most uh, sort of awful sites in terms of uh, this idea of death in mythology. And, and so um, if you're from Texas, you might recognize, but mostly you would recognize the Alamo probably. Um, so I, did, I, I collected this air, put it into a tank. Uh, here I am d literally sort of sucking it out of the Alamo. And then it was, the reason I don't want to talk about this too much is because it wasn't really necessarily a public project. It was actually at an art gallery, but it, but it deals with the whole notion of public consciousness, which I think is really important. And in this case, what I did is I then hired a balloon artist to come in and uh, taking the air that I collected, fill these long latex balloons and had him design these huge, very elaborate hats. And I used hats because it also deals with the notion of identity if you think about Texas and the Texas hat and so on. So there was a little bit of play on that. So the whole gallery is just covered with these hats. Of course, latex balloons don't hold the air. By the end of the show, they were all collapsed and they became this kind of, so you were kind of breathing the air uh, as you walk through the gallery from all these different sites. Uh, the air has become kind of a major part of some projects that I've done recently. And I show this one primarily because it's a, uh, it's a library project and I thought it would be appropriate to show it here. Uh, thinking about, I was invited to participate in a project in, uh, at the University of Toronto in Ontario and the place in which the project was taking place was in the Student Union, which was a, a building from the 1920s, but it was kind of modeled after uh, a, um, the, 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 a building in Cambridge um, at the university in England. And um, I, became, I became sort of interested in, the, in this small library, which was a, you know, just, um, and was sort of wondering why, I mean, there's so many books, and yet there were all this empty space. And I started thinking about the whole notion of knowledge and uh, the ephemeral aspect of the, of, of the internet uh, versus an object like a book. And somehow I found myself just wanting to fill the space with, with something. And, I developed this project um, where I invited students to fill up a balloon. And I didn't, at that time I didn't ask them to do a self-portrait, I just asked them to draw a face. So I, I was collecting their breath, and then I was asking them to draw a drawing on it of a face. And what I didn't realize is how animated those faces would become. I mean, I was really, I, I, was, I was pleased at how, and I just thought they'd be like these little stick things, you know, sort of these kind of, um, and it kind of, that, that kind of led me to some, uh, to, uh, to some later projects, uh, which I'll show you. But <clears throat> anyway, so what happens is that just, there are about 500 balloons and it fills all the empty space in this little miniature library. And the beauty of it is, I mean, there's kind of like this interesting sort of pathos, I think, involved in this. But the beauty is that they also collapse and they become sort of animated in a whole other way, almost uh, kind of sad in some sense. And the thing is that, uh, and here you can see them collapsing. I'll show you a couple of these. But the thing is that, that what's, what's, this was a very low budget project, you know. So, so it's the idea of sort of having, to be able to do something with impact that has also not like these huge budget projects, but you can actually do things that have impact for very little money. So it takes on a whole other character as the air sort of goes out. I, I think this is how David and I feel, you know, with all the budget cuts and things. We're just, you know, this is, <laughs> as it says, university over here, and you're kind of going. <laughs> okay, uh, two more projects very quickly. Uh, are we doing okay? Okay. Um, this, is, this is probably, I think, uh, in terms of uh, one of my favorite projects that I have done on my own since Kate's death. It's called Breathe In and Breathe Out. <coughs> and I was invited uh, to participate um, or to do a project for the Salina Art Center. Salina is a town of about 50,000 in the middle of Kansas. And they are some of the most sophisticated, uh, you know, uh, art appreciators that I know because they had this wonderful uh, curator there by the name of Sarah Lynn Hardy whose mission was to educate the community so that they could do really interesting art and and that's uh, that's what she did and, and she did a great job of it um, so 
there's the Community Arts Center, which is on Main Street, and I was asked to do a project with them, but it was also in conjunction with a, uh, it's called the Three Rivers, no, not, that's, that's Pittsburgh, it's the Smoky Hill Rivers Arts Festival. And in this case, um, what I did, uh, I had to have design a project that could work in both spaces, but the opening at the museum or at the art center was two weeks before the festival. So I had to also had to have something on wheels that could move. So I developed this project called Breathe In, Breathe Out, and it was a continuation of this idea of the breath, the collection of breath. Uh, in this case, it was a collection of the community breath. And I, I um, had what, uh, let's go over this. The Breathe In uh, is the neon. It's actually the incoming mayor's handwriting. The Breathe Out is the outgoing mayor's handwriting, all done in neon. And then what I did, I developed what I call the BCDs, the breath collection devices. And these were just something I kind of put together with these valves so that individually I could, I could, I could take one balloon and I could extract the air. I could extract all, there were a 64 at one time that I could do. It was connected, <coughs> they were all connected via this pipe to an air compressor on a trailer with a 16 foot uh, tank, air tank. So I would ask people literally to blow up a balloon. And at that point, I didn't ask them to do anything other than sign their name. I wanted their name on the balloon. And this is at the festival. We collected uh, about 4,000 samples of community breath, all pumped into the tank. Everybody was asked to sign the tank. And then this is what happened with the spent balloons. They were all put on the wall in the gallery. Um, at the end of the summer, the project then, after the festival, went back to the Community Arts Center. We continued to collect air. At the end of the summer, we had this, we had this big event called the Big Blowout. And I pulled the tank out to the local car wash uh, gas station where people would normally get the air for their tires. And I simply asked them to, it was advertised, people knew it was happening. I asked them that I would like to fill their tires with community air. <laughs> so I had a steady flow of people coming all day, including the, the two police cars that are on, you know, there, uh, including the mayor came. Um, soccer ball. <laughs> but the best part was, uh, the day that the big blowout was happening was a Friday. It was the first time, it was the first, uh, it was at the end of the summer, but it was the first football game of the season. So I actually asked the coach if I could deflate the ball and reinflate it with community air. And this ball right here is filled with community air. And the nice part, the best part was, that it was actually announced as, as, a, as a project uh, in this, I mean, the, the announcer. And, and uh, I, I, was, I was so happy because I was out there photographing it and it just made me very happy to have this actually happen. I tried to do this uh, at one point with the um, Dallas Mavericks. I wanted to do a project with the, with the ball air and, it, and I couldn't convince uh, the owner uh, whose name I can't recollect right now, but anyway, uh, it didn't happen, but we tried. We tried very hard to get it to happen. So um, I'm going to end on the downtown mixer, which David talked a little bit about, and I'll go through that very quickly. Uh, I was invited by the uh, Buffalo Bayou Art Park, which normally does projects um, in the park. I mean, they don't normally go outside of this park, and the park is next to the bayou. It's not really, it's part of downtown, but it's, it's sort of <coughs> a side to downtown. And I knew the director, it was a, a new young um, artist who became the director and she specifically invited me because she knew that I wouldn't want to do anything in the park, that I would want to kind of go into the city and do something. So, uh, and it's exactly what happened. I mean, I really didn't want to do anything in the park. So, it's not the way I work, it's not the way I think. Uh, I lived in Houston for two years um, and I kind of had a sense of, you know, uh, how, it, it kind of, how Houston operates, and I was sort of curious about these uh, high-rises, these glass high-rises with reflective glass, and all these people working in there who never kind of meet or mingle. I mean, they kind of go in, they go down to the basement to eat, and they go back up and they work, and then they go home. And, and, and you know, it's sort of like, Dallas is a little bit this way too. You don't see anybody on the street. I mean, you basically, uh, you know, you're, you're wondering where all the people are. It's because they're all downtown, you know, they're all underneath. 
um, or they're in, you know, they're just, they just stay in the building. So I kind of wanted to create this way in which I would mingle people and mix them up somehow. And so this is the downtown mixer. And it's a similar thing where I, what I did is I collected samples of breath. I set myself up with uh, volunteers and help uh, in eight different buildings in downtown, eight different high rises, and uh, which were all sort of in the kind of a, a vicinity, a sort of a, an area that they all kind of could walk to. I mean, it was several blocks wide. I mean, it wasn't just one or two blocks, but, uh, and every building had a different color balloon. So you'd kind of have a code as to what building you were in. But I did, in this case, what I did is I asked people to participate by blowing up a balloon, collecting the breath, but then also drawing a self-portrait on the balloon. And so, you know, some people's self-portraits, I mean, they really did try to make it as, as uh, you know, the best they could. And others just kind of had fun with it. Um, there were about 1,600 uh, samples of breath that we collected. And part of it, um, you know, talking about sort of, it was a process. I mean, part of it, so much of it was this process. It was the idea of actually being in this corporate culture, setting up and asking the, you know, asking uh, people to do this ridiculous thing. I mean, that was all part of the project. It was all kind of like in your face. Here we are. We're in this kind of uh, perfect sort of corporate environment. We're going to kind of play with, play with this and, and, and mess it up a little bit. And, and, you know, I was asking, too, I mean, I, 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 mean, I was out there trying to get people. There were, point, there, were, there, there were times when people wouldn't even look at me. They were so disgusted. And there were, there were times when people just, there was, there was one gentleman who looked at me and said, will you please get a job, you know? And so, um, but again, that's all part of it because you're kind of, you're trying to say, well, you know, okay. And even, even the presence, I mean, as we, were, as we were collecting them and pulling them into a central space in which we could work with them, that was all, you know, again, I, it was kind of to kind of get that kind of visuality going, that kind of sense of something's happening, but we don't know what. And then we set up and we started, you know, we had to sort of attach these um, pipe cleaners to the balloons, and so we just set up, and that was also part of it. I and mean, we were kind of in the middle of the corporate lobby. And we put pedestals on. And then we just set them back into the lobbies, but they were all mixed up. So, you, so all the different colors from all the different buildings, and of course, it's the same thing. The air kind of slowly seeps out. So it was this idea of sort of mixing the breath of all these different people from all different areas. And here are just some examples of the projects, or, or just having it in, in the site in situ. And people did walk around and look for their self-portrait. I mean, they were really, they would go from building to building and try to figure out where their, where their balloon was. Uh, it was temporary. It was up for a month. And, um, uh, and again, they sort of collapsed. And that, that, was, that was the end. So I think this is, that we only have a couple more slides. And that will be it. And then we can. And again, the collapse as well. They kind of, you know, they were interested when they were full balloons, but when they started collapsing, they got very, they started getting upset because they didn't think it looked as good. Um, so it actually came down a week early because they were, they, they started getting upset about how it looked, and so we we did take it down. Okay, David, I'm going to leave it at that, and we can talk. Well, I'll just ask uh, Mel uh, one or two questions, then we can uh, all uh, ask him questions. Um, I suppose the, the, the big question I have in, in my mind sort of goes back to the Durham uh, piece where you were, people didn't like the fact that you, at least some people, didn't like the fact that you'd gone in there and, and written on the sidewalks and so on. Um, I guess I'm trying to figure out um, 
what you hope art will do to the people who get exposed to it. And I suppose the question would be, the first question would be, how did, what was left, or what was the, the feeling in, in that community after you'd done all these things, you'd, you, you'd replaced the sidewalk in a perfectly good way and, and uh, so that there was no, almost no trace of what you had done. I mean, where, where was, was there a change that took place where people left kind of resentful or were they left scratching their head or were they left thinking, you know, maybe we should have not protested the way we did? Or, and how has that experience evolved into the kind of participatory uh, mode of engagement that you are involved in now? And just as a writer, because that's, that's the same sort of question, is, is the, are you, I mean, a lot of the, you, you talked about process. You talk about having these things up for, you know, a couple of weeks, a month, or whatever, and then disappearing. I mean, that suggests that the, almost the aim of the art is to change the consciousness of people, not to produce objects or balloons or anything like that. I mean, is, is that, am I getting that right? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's the main goal. And so I don't think, I think that that can be done um, you know, it, it, it can be done through memory. It can be done through the process. And so that, that's why I'm saying that, particularly in like Downtown Mixer, how important that process was. It wasn't sort of the actual physical manifestation of the project, more it was the event and the fact that we were there and we were saying to people, blow up a balloon and draw a self-portrait, um, which was sort of, uh, which was against sort of the corporate culture. I mean, we were in there asking something really absurd and that was part of the, the humor of it and part of the sort of, uh, you know, attempt at sort of questioning <coughs> even how corporate culture and how corporate architecture actually functions. Um, you know, in terms of Durham, we made a mistake. I mean, we, we were young artists and, and we thought that, again, that the press would disseminate information. And they did. They just did it their way. I mean, they sold papers with it. That we did not leave that town in a very good way. I mean, people really hated us. In fact, there was an article, there were, there were so many letters to the editor, there was a, a council member, interesting enough, who had actually, if, if you think about it, he stole several of the chunks and put them in his trunk. And a year later, he writes into the newspaper and says, okay, I still have these pieces in my trunk. What do you suggest I do with them? You know, and, and unfortunately, Kate and I thought at the time, because someone sent us the, the uh, letter, and, and we thought, oh, well, let's just list like 100 different things that they could do with them, like a doorstop or, you know, I mean, and we didn't do it. We should have. It would have been a nice way to sort of re-engage the community. Uh, they were so angry at us. We were invited to do a lecture at Duke, and the teacher said, I can't tell the students who's coming because the parents will really get upset. You know? So, uh, and that was bad. That was not a good thing. And, and so in a way, um, I don't know in terms of that, we lost that engagement. And we lost it because we didn't engage the community prior to, uh, like in the case of the, the, the Charleston project, um, the community really did get engaged. But we had four community meetings prior to doing that project to s explain the project, show them some things that we had done before, and said, okay, you know, this is what we'd like to do here. Uh, we weren't asking for permission. What we were doing is saying, we're going to do this, and we'd like to engage you all. We'd like to have you bring your school groups. We'd like to have you, you know, and talk about it. Uh, and it worked very well. I mean, so that engagement is, is, is really important, particularly with public art. Um, and the thing is, is that as doing things that are temporary, which uh, I, I, I uh, believe in a lot, I mean, um, you can get away with things that you might not be able to get away with otherwise. I mean, so you can do some pretty amazing things if it's temporary and, and, and you can kind of get forgiveness. But uh, Kate and I never, you know, and even now, I, I w never do uh, what might be guerrilla projects. I mean, I, I want to go through the process. I want to get permission. I want to get permits. It's all very important to me. And you know, we're talking about painting columns. I'm working on a project right now at UVA, the University of Virginia, in which I do want to paint their columns. Uh, and it's, it, you know, I ha I'm, I'm leaving this afternoon to have two days of meetings to try to convince them that it's okay to just paint their columns for two weeks in different colors. So uh, it's all part of the process. I mean, it's kind of getting that dialogue going. And what's interesting there is I already have students writing articles because the students want it to happen. It's the, it's, the, it's the administrators who are saying, well, wait a minute, you know, what does this mean, you know, and, and what are you trying to say about our campus? And, but that's, 
that's opening up a dialogue, which I think is really important. That's the main main goal here. Uh, I'm just reminded, that, uh, just a comment, and then then we'll ask the audience for questions or the not the audience. We've got to have a new name, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> participants. Um, participants. Um, I, I'm reminded of, of Joseph Boyce, who who's, you know said that uh, for him, you know, everyone was an artist. I mean, and part of the point of art, I guess, would be to bring out the artistry in everyone else. Which I mean, the, the the end result of that might be the the abolition of artists, because art would have succeeded, as it were, in bringing out the creativity of everyone else. I mean, I have a sense that a bit of you is is going in that direction. Well, I think I, you know maybe maybe it has to do with my upbringing. I mean, I I grew up in a dairy farm. Maybe there's a little bit of that kind of pragmatic aspect. But I mean, I always thought as an artist, I mean, how do how am I how do I situate myself uh, in terms of a productive citizen? Uh, like anybody else. I mean, how, how am I uh, producing in relationship to the carpenter, the plumber? Um, and so, in a way, that has that actually has, has uh, informed my work and my production very much. I mean, that attitude has informed my production, and I think I continue that. I mean, I, I kind of like sort of collaborating with, you know, with, with people that do things like me. I mean, it's just that I, I'm an artist. And, and, and the thing is that when I, when I do these projects, I never... I never shy away from the fact that I'm an artist. I mean, the house projects that we did, we'd always say, this is art, we're making an art project. Uh, do you want to participate? And there was always, there was usually some type of economic exchange. I mean, there were things where painting a house, someone gets a house painted, like in the case of the Charleston project. At the end, they got their house painted uh, as part of the project. So that's kind of an important part of it. But. Let's see what qu questions we have uh, from the audience. Do you have a Microphone. One back there. And then there. The one that's on your right. Um, do you find that uh, you have to have a low budget? I'm sorry. Is the low budget uh, component necessary if it's going to be temporary? Uh, is, that, is that one of the things that you have to present that is an incentive to do it? or? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, I, I mean, I've worked with uh, numerous different budgets. Um, in fact, the temporary project, the temporary project UVA, is a fifty thousand dollar project. So, uh, but and and the Charleston project was probably a twenty five thousand dollar project. I mean, so but I've but I've also done a lot of things for two thousand dollars or less, and and uh, it's just a way of looking and assessing and making something work based on what it is that you might be offered by a community organization or that you can afford yourself to do something. So, uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, I guess the thing is, that, you know, like the Durham Project, because it was $10,000, everybody thought that was a huge amount of money. I mean, artists got, you know, artists got to be paid too. And so uh, what we were trying to do was say only $2,000 of that is our fee. The rest of it goes back to the community pretty much. So. Yes, it, it seems that the really the most important part of this art is not the project, but is the audience or the participants. And if you you couldn't do it without the participants, it wouldn't happen. It wouldn't be art. Have you ever taken any of these projects and redone them in different parts of the country with different participants? And how would that change things? Uh, I never have. I mean, mostly because I think they have a relationship to the site that they're taking place in. So uh, there might be some similarities, like with the air or the collection of air and so on. But I, but I, but I've never. I mean, I wish I could. I mean, there were many times that it was, you know, that there, you know, if you have a show, it can move around from one gallery to the next. But when you're doing these kind of community-oriented projects, it's it's almost impossible to do that. And so. But again, what, I, what I'm trying to do is respond to a site, uh, respond to the context, the history, the place, uh, which makes it specific to this, to, to that community, and, and, and has that dialogue. You know, so uh, if I did like the text project on the sidewalk, it's possible that could happen somewhere else, but it would be a very different project. So. Okay, another question. Good luck at our UVA. Charlottesville may never be. <laughs> I just wondered if you could give us, uh, and this is, this, is, this is fascinating, but it's different than anything I've ever seen before. A lot of us probably <coughs> haven't witnessed anything quite, uh, quite this unusual. But can you give us your definition of art? 
You know, I, I, I'm, um, I'm not sure I can give you a definition, but I, but I do think, uh, talk a little bit, I mean, just in terms of public art, because uh, to me, I, you know, it's pretty important to me, but as an arts commissioner, the one thing that I found was that, um, uh, that art can have many, many different forms. I mean, it, it's not one particular thing. And so as long as we're able to embrace that idea that it can be many things, uh, that, you know, or even that the idea that, uh, uh, you know, public art can be, it can be a bronze statue, it can be, you know, it, can, it can be, the, you know, the um, Alice Acock piece. I mean, there are so many manifestations of what that can be. And there's no reason why all of it can't exist at the same time. Uh, I mean, I, you know, so, uh, <clears throat> and I think, I think it's just, you know, like in, in, in Austin, for example, um, there was a group that wanted to have bronze statues everywhere. I mean, they want, you know, and so the public art, the art in public places was saying, well, no, we're, we, we're something else, you know. But the reality is they had every right to want those bronze statues too. If there's, if there's a good, you know, and I think their best project that they commissioned was something called Philosopher's Rock. And it was these three philosophers from, you know, I don't know, maybe you even know them, but uh, from the University of Texas who used to hang out at Barton Springs and talk all the time by this rock. And so they became immortalized by this bronze sculpture. And it's beloved by everybody. And it's just almost an identity, you know, uh, you know, something that's almost in every brochure of Austin in terms of the tourism. So I, 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 my idea is not to be closed-minded, not to sort of close things off, but to sort of open it up and say this, it can all, all exist. The type of work I do can exist alongside of the Alice Acock. There's no reason why a community shouldn't embrace temporary projects as well as permanent projects because the temporary projects are also things that can happen and engage the community and inform them of what, what can happen with artwork, you know, or, or a certain issue that comes up that at, at a certain time might be uh, a very important pertinent issue and the temporary project is the way to sort of address that and engage that. So. We, 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 unfortunately, this is a temporary project too. We have to keep, <laughs> keep moving. We've got a, a gentleman over there. Yes. Yes, I had a question about the sidewalk painting project. Uh -huh. uh, would you consider that something that you learned from? Would, would that be better done uh, if it had been na announced in advance and gotten communi community involvement in it? Uh, would it have been better received and could it be done again? Um. Absolutely, it would have been better received if we had done that. Uh, I think that we, because it was a public art conference, I think we thought that that in conjunction with the newspaper would be, would, would again sort of be enough information. And we also thought the public art conference would sort of, what we didn't realize, the public art conference wasn't for the local community. It was people coming all over from all, from all over the United States. And so that was just, it was like a convention of public art administrators. <laughs> And uh, so what we were doing, they, I mean, they understood what we were doing, but the local community did not. And so, yeah, it was, it, again, it was, it was a huge learning experience for us. Okay, another question there? Yeah. Yes. The columns that you were talking about painting, I'm assuming that that was temporary. Uh, it is temporary, yes. <laughs> it hasn't been done yet. It is temporary. I mean, the thing is, if you've ever been to UVA, uh, I mean, there are just white columns everywhere, you know. I mean, it's white columns with red brick. And some of these are, you know, 30, 40 feet tall. And I, what, I'm, I, what I'm proposing is to paint uh, one column in about 20 different buildings, one column per building, but the color is determined by the users of the building. So if it's the philosophy department, I'm getting together with the philosophy students uh, to actually determine what that color should be. And this is, uh, so, so, and, and the, the request is, these are already painted columns, they're all painted white, so the idea is no columns will be painted that aren't already painted. The problem is it also has this kind of strange twist between the idea of permanence and impermanence. Somehow paint is the big issue, and I'm saying, would you just repaint it white? No, you know, it's a, it's a temporary thing, but, but the idea of actually painting them has become a huge issue because that's, it's, it's seemingly permanent even though it's not. And so that's the issue right now. I'll let, I'll let you all know. I mean, we'll, we'll figure this out. Or you, you might see it sometime. I don't know. But. I think we have just one last question from the cluster of questions in that. Uh, oh, I um, was fascinated by your story about collecting and sucking up all that community air, but it was the most menacing and just 
disgusting thing I have ever seen. <laughs> and I am so glad that you're so young, because if you'd been living in the 30s and 40s and 50s, whew, you would have been stoned. Because when we drove through town, we had to roll our windows up, because everybody was scared to death before 1955 about all the polio. You didn't want to breathe anything. And I just wondered, did you ever get any kind of feedback from the Surgeon General when you were in <laughs> community air released it inside of the well, building? I know you couldn't have gotten by with it before 1955, but what, you're, you're so young, you don't know anything about that, I'm sure. <laughs> No, actually, I, it, uh, particularly in the in the breathe in, breathe out, because I mean, I had four thousand breath samples in there, and as you know, there's moisture in breath, and so uh, it was an issue. And what we did is we added ozone. I had an ozonator attached to the whole thing, and uh, as I understand, or at least through my research, the ozone actually would kill the bacteria. So we we pumped in at the same time we pumped in the air, we pumped in ozone to kill the bacteria. So. <laughs> No, none whatsoever. <laughs> and that would have been my response. I mean, we did, I did try to, you know, to take care of that. Thank you for all your questions. Come back.